Uh, well, good. Well, good evening, my friends. <laughs> um, first, let me just say uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, 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 the weather outside is frightful, but you look so delightful. And uh, I just want you to know how much I personally and we at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace appreciate you being out here tonight in these conditions. Uh, it will be worth it for you. Uh, it will be worth it for you. You will learn things as I continue to learn from Mark Braverman. And so I just want to say uh, a warm uh, a welcome and appreciation. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm uh, the executive director of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We uh, educate, uh, 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 enlighten, and uh, engage for peace, justice, and intercultural understanding, both here in this region and around the world. And again, welcome. I want to, before I say anything more, I want to uh, introduce you to uh, John Gardner, pastor, my pastor here at Plymouth Congregational Church, to say a word of welcome. Let me add my voice uh, to Michael's uh, commending you for venturing out this evening, uh, that we can spend these moments together. 
On behalf of Plymouth Church, uh, I want to extend welcome. There are words that we repeat here, really, uh, with uh, regularity. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So uh, if things begin to break down or you're wondering to turn left or right, uh, speak with me and uh, take a gamble. <laughs> see, see if I see if I can be helpful. There is a uh, restroom facility in the in the Northex, and of course uh, there are facilities uh, available uh, around the Folsom Room where we will gather following our time here together. I just want to say it's a really a special honor to welcome Mark Braverman here into the sanctuary, and I'll just make a personal pitch. Uh, uh, we know that from his previous visit, he's a, an engaging speaker, but uh, his writing work, his written work, is really very important. And uh, so buy a book and read up uh, on uh, the way in which he's able to instruct us and to illuminate us on some issues that are really very dicey and, and in which they're hard to navigate. We have a, sorry to go on, well, well too long here, well, hopefully it's not too long, but I mean, in our United Church of Christ statement of faith, uh, there is a promise from the divine that reminds us that there is courage that comes to us when we are engaged in the struggle for justice and peace. And I think one of the things we lack, at least in the Christian tradition, sometimes uh, we lack that, uh, that courage to step out on significant issues of the day. So here we have, uh, once again, uh, a Jew teaching us how to be courageous. And uh, for that, uh, very, very grateful. Very, very grateful. So buy a book and uh, uh, be supportive. And again, Mark, I'm just thrilled that you are, you are with us in the sanctuary tonight. Blessings. Thank you, John. <clears throat> a couple of housekeeping details just for coming attractions with Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We uh, have canceled, uh, <clears throat> if you have our, if you have our uh, program booklet for the year, we've canceled the uh, uh, screening and discussion of uh, uh, Half the Sky uh, at the Unitarian Congregation on the 17th and 18th of February. We will be rescheduling that uh, for down the road. So just notice that we've canceled uh, Fe February 17th and 18th. Our next program for the public is Greg Meyer. Uh, <clears throat> his title is Lessons from the Front Lines of Israel and Palestine. And let me just read to you about that program. Greg Meyer is foreign editor for digital news at NPR. From 1987 to 2007 for the New York Times and AP, he covered the 1991 Gulf War, Pakistan, the Taliban in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, America's wars in the region, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict inspiring the book that he co-wrote with his wife, the, This Burning Land, Lessons from the Front Lines of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And it was co-authored, as I say, with his wife, uh, Jennifer Griffin, a uh, reporter with Fox. And so that will be on Thursday, February 27th, Thursday, February 27th, 7 o'clock, at First Presbyterian Church, just uh, down the road here. So please join us uh, if you're able to do that on Thursday, February 27th. We have some sweets and treats and some coffee and things uh, afterward. To, I know it's I know you're anxious to, to get home maybe afterwards, but linger for a minute or so. Say hi to Mark. Have him sign your book that you'll buy uh, afterwards uh, in the Folsom Room. Uh, there are a number of materials. Uh, he'll talk about his, his latest book, uh, but really uh, very important work. And so I encourage you to linger for a few minutes afterwards. I'm going to introduce now Dr. Ron Caldwell from our board, who will introduce Mark Braverman. Thanks, Ron. And John Gardner, uh, thank you uh, and the good people at Plymouth Church for uh, welcoming us so warmly, as you always do as partners here in the work of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Thank you all for coming out. Um, as many of you know, uh, Janie and I were privileged to participate in one of Michael's Pilgrims of Hope, a study and solidarity tour of Israel-Palestine in February and March 2012. It so happens that this guy named Mark Braverman was on the same trip, and uh, Terry met him uh, on the way back to Tel Aviv Airport, um, and 
it was all Jerry Mackle's fault. He got me interested in this to my wife's chagrin at first, but I, I'm so happy that my wife had the courage to go with us and go with the transforming trip. My main reference source was what, my, what Mark said he should have named Fatal Attraction, but it's <laughs> Fatal Embrace, and it was just my, my uh, main reference point that I fortunately read before I went, which made the trip so much better. Mark is an American Jewish psychologist raised on the American Jewish Zionist narrative, and he was visiting family in Jerusalem in 2006, and he witnessed the occupation, the oppressive Israeli occupation of Palestine firsthand, and he returned home and made it his life's work to, uh, to work against this problem. He's now an internationally known and respected author and activist on the rule of, uh, on the rule of faith, role of faith traditions in bringing healing and peace to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He's program director for Kairos USA, which he'll, I'm sure, talk about that. He is co-founder of Friends of Tent of Nations North America, which sponsors his brother in Christ. I think, I think he would do anything for Daoud Nasser, who has been here in town, and we I had the privilege of of seeing and visiting Dawood's farm at Tent of Nations. It was the holiest place I saw in all of Palestine. Um, I find him, I always say this, I ask him if I could say it, it's accurate. I find him to be one of the most fervent followers of Jesus I have ever met. And as he'll say, he's still a Jew, but he's a fervent follower of the Palestinian Jew Jesus. So Jeannie and I consider him now a friend since we've had him in our house last year and this year, and he tends to wear my clothes when he gets cold in the house, so I guess I can call him a friend. His latest book, which he, I assume, will speak about tonight, is called A Wall in Jerusalem, Hope, Healing, and the Struggle for Justice in Israel and Palestine. We welcome Mark Braverman. These are all his own clothes. Are you are you sure? <laughs> well, so before I before I really get started, I want to say the thank yous because then I'll forget to do it, and it's 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 very very important to do that. Um, uh, first of all, I I want to thank uh, the Indiana Center for. Middle East peace for once again um, having me back. I have really been looking forward to coming back to Fort Wayne, um, and I uh, and you haven't disappointed. It's just lovely to be here to, to meet old friends and to make new friends. It's, it starts to feel like starts to feel like home. In fact, it may be home for a week if I can't get out of here. Tomorrow. <laughs> and then you and then I'm I'm going to need like a whole wardrobe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a special shout out to, to, to Michael Spat, who uh, is just one of the more energetic, courageous people uh, that I've met in this journey. Uh, but I think I can include that to the whole board that I've met here, and, and many of you. Um, wonderful, wonderful community. It is lovely to be connected to you, um, and to and to John um, uh, for welcoming us to to your to your church and to your. Lovely words, John. Uh, thank you. You know, I, I sat in John's office, uh, as I often do, uh, always do, before I'm getting up to give a talk and made some notes about what I want to talk about. I mean, I, I might as well. It's, it's a useless exercise for me. Because you don't know what you're going to say. Assuming you're doing your job and you're speaking from your heart, you don't know what you're going to say when you get up because in front of a group of people because, for one thing, something mysterious and magical happens. This is a conversation. I'm, we're connected. And so what, what's coming out of my mouth and what is coming through me to talk about, it's absolutely unpredictable until this moment arrives. So I have my notes in front of me, but um, you'll notice I'm not going to, to look at them. I am, however, going to try to keep track of my watch because I know you guys are going to have to, we've got to get home tonight. And we can't both tarry for too long. Um, and uh, the, the best part of this is when I 
stop talking. And when we start to have conversation, we have Q&A. And uh, so I'm really going to work hard to try to keep my comments. Um, I'm going to cover the things I want to talk about, but I'm going to try to keep them brief so that then we can really, we can really talk. Um, so when, when John was, was up here um, speaking uh, and giving his introduction, what I, what I realized was that <coughs> um, uh, I want to say a prayer. And, uh, but I'm going to preface it with a story. And that's going to lead into the prayer, I think. Uh, and it has to do with um, me, the fact that, as you mentioned several times, uh, I'm an American Jew, and here I am, as I do all the time, in a church sanctuary, speaking to, uh, I'm assuming, an almost entirely Christian, Christian audience, although I know there are Muslims here, and there may be Jewish people here as well. And I want to touch on that, too, because I know that the last speaker that you had, or recent speaker that you had, was also a Jewish speaker, and that there was some commotion that came out of that, and that the, the issue for you about the relationship with the Jewish community is very hot. It's the elephant in the room. I want to spend some time talking about it. Uh, the story I want to tell is something that happened early on in this sort of second career of mine. Uh, maybe a year or two after I got back from the West Bank for the first time. And uh, I was speaking in a Catholic church. In fact, I think I was up on the dais with Daoud Nassar. So we were both speaking. And it was a, an evening. It was on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And it was a Catholic church, a fairly new, modern building. And uh, I got up and I, you know, I, I did my thing. And I talked about Palestine. And I talked about um, my work and what had happened to me over there. And a woman in the front row, when we got down to questions, raised her hand and said, well, like, what's your synagogue? We're, you know, Christians always want to, church people want to know, where do you worship, right? And so she said, well, so I'm curious about you. You're a Jew, you're here in this church. What's your synagogue? What synagogue do you go to? Now, I wasn't ready for the question, and I didn't have a quick answer, a ready answer, because I am not currently associated or affiliated with the synagogue. And that, by the way, had happened long before I went to the West Bank and got involved in this work. I had not been in synagogue. I had, uh, it was not a place, it had stopped being a place for me for a number of reasons that I think are starting to become more clear to me now. So I couldn't say, oh yes, I worship at Temple Bethel in you know, Bethesda, Maryland, my rabbi is so-and-so. I didn't have that answer. But as is often the case, when someone asks you a question that you don't have an answer ready for, Sometimes the answer that comes up will, will surprise you because it's totally unprepared. It's something you didn't know you thought or felt. I looked right back at her and I said, you're sitting in it. What I'm doing right now, in the place that I'm in right now, this is my synagogue. This is my place of worship. This is where I go to be the best Jew that I can be. This is where I feel a sense of communion with God, where I feel a sense of connection with a community, ecclesia, a church, a beloved community, if you will. This is it. This is my synagogue. I mean, and, and it came to me at that moment. Of course, I wasn't quite finished. We're in a Catholic church, right? Over the altar. There he hangs, right? A big cross, a big crucifix, bigger than life, because it was a modern church, and they had really, really done it up. So Jesus is there, hanging on the cross, right over my right shoulder. I said, so, so this is my synagogue, and I know that the visionary rabbi whose image hangs over my right shoulder, would totally endorse that statement. So, welcome to our synagogue. <laughs> and, you know, the jaws, you know, were down to here at that point. And then there was applause. Now, it was not for me. People were acknowledging that something very important was happening for all of us sitting there at that moment. 
talking about what we were talking about in the place where we were talking about it under his you know, gaze. And it was about us, and it was about him. So I guess that's my prayer. My prayer would be creator of us all, welcome us into your synagogue. Welcome us into your place of worship. Put us in touch with that moment where Jesus turns up in Nazareth on that Shabbat, unfurls the scroll of Isaiah, and proclaims his mission and his ministry and calls us to it. Open our eyes. Free us from our captivity. Feed the hungry. Take care of the oppressed. Let us remember that. Let us know that that is what we are here to do. And that this is bigger than Palestine. This is bigger than one particular human rights issue. As huge and as important as it is. This is about who we are. This is about our future as a community, as a civilization. This is about whether we are really going to be members of a church, of a synagogue, of a mosque, of a beloved worshiping community, or whether we're going to go on and allow you know, the world to spin down into where it seems to be spinning down into. This is an opportunity. Grant us that vision. Welcome us into your synagogue. Give us that chance. Open up this Kairos moment, this, this moment of grace and opportunity, this opening in history, this opening in time that has been given to us in this generation. Open our eyes to the signs of the times, to the rubble of Gaza, to the checkpoints of Nablus and Bethlehem, to the ethnic cleansing and Judaization of Jerusalem, you know, to the modern Jewish crusade you know, to liberate the Holy Land from those others. Jewish slash Israeli slash American crusade. Give us that vision. Welcome to our synagogue. So let's sort of, let's get right down to business. Um, <laughs> I gave a talk recently at an evangelical um, conference in Denver. I have some, some pretty cool, pretty radical evangelical friends who uh, asked me to give talks sometimes. And uh, Carl, uh, my, my friend, uh, said, okay, but listen, remember the audience, you know, we're trying to pull a lot of people in who's, you know, theology is kind of conservative, the politics is kind of conservative, so don't, you know, don't talk about politics. <laughs> I said, okay, so call. So I think what I got up and <laughs> said was I said, so <clears throat> I've been asked not to talk about politics. Okay? I'm here to talk about Jesus, which means I'm here to talk about politics. And which is what I did, and, and it was fine. And Carl was, I mean, he, he didn't expect to, me to listen to him. He knew what I was going to do. This really is about politics. Jesus, by the way, did not turn up in first century Palestine by accident. He turned up there for a reason. He turned up there as a Palestinian Jew whose people, the indigenous population of Palestine, was under the heel of the Roman Empire, which was the worst evil that the world had ever seen at that, at, at that point. And what Rome was trying to do, which it did with all of its subjects, was to turn the colonial subjects of Palestine away from their own faith their own Torah, which basically Torah means the way, the lesson, the instructions 
for how to live a decent, compassionate life in your community. Equality, jubilee. Nobody gets too rich. You spread it out. You take care of one another. And you take care of the most vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the poor. And Rome was saying, no, no, no. You're going to feed the beast of empire. We got this temple. We got this Jewish king who works for us. We got the whole the priests who are administering this temple under the Jewish king who works for us, who collects the taxes, who sucks the blood and the life out of you and feeds the beast of empire. And Jesus said, this is not my kingdom. This is not our father's kingdom. Here's my kingdom. And he just quotes from Isaiah and the Psalms. He was bringing Torah. He was doing more than that. But that's why Jesus turned up. And when he stood in front of the temple and said, destroy this temple, or at another point he said, in three days it's all coming down. He wasn't talking about explosives. He was talking about a demolition project much more powerful than dynamite or a drone attack. And he was saying, and I will build it up in three days. And of course, the apostles who, you know, they're written into the scriptures, Jesus is straight men, right? They are eternally clueless. They don't get it. They never get what he's saying. He has to tell them three or four times, and they still don't get it. But in the Gospel of John, when Jesus says this, and the apostles say, Master, what do you mean you will build this in three days? This remodeling project to make this a bigger and better temple has been going on for 46 years. How are you going to build it up in three days? They don't get it. They have no idea what he's talking about. And so the narrator of the gospel says, so we'll understand it, like we're six years old, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Body of Christ. One communion of humankind. United in compassion, in love. All of us together, one body, instead of that temple, which was a monument to greed and empire and the 1% living off the 99%. But Jesus was making a political statement, very seditious. That's what got him killed. He knew that. The opportunity for us is if you take a look at the first century in Palestine, and you take a look at the 21st century in Palestine, same story. I've had this phrase in my head for years, and I've, I always told myself, you know, I'm not going to say this in public because, you know, if you want to get Braverman in trouble, and if there's anybody in the back taking notes <clears throat> to publish it in the paper tomorrow morning, right, this is definitely going to make it into the, into the newspaper. But... I'm saying this now because we don't have time to beat around the bush anymore. People are fond of asking the question, what would Jesus do if he came back today? If he came back to Jerusalem today, you know, standing on the Mount of Olives weeping for Jerusalem, oh my people, right? I know what Jesus would do today when he comes back to Jerusalem. If he came back to Jerusalem, he would stand in front of the Knesset and he would say, destroy this temple. Now, he's not talking about a suicide bombing, you see. He's making a political statement. He's saying, this is not it. This is not my kingdom. This is not redemption. Not for the Jews, not for anybody. Destroy this temple. And let's build it in three days. Let's go from Friday to Sunday and make something new. And my friends, that's what we're involved in. We are part of a movement. Certainly right here in Fort Wayne, you are part of a movement. You are part of a national movement. I go from city to city to city. I'm invited by different versions of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Mostly Christians, mostly churched, not all, who've gotten together and said, we are in a community here, and we want to do something. And you do it with very little, and you're doing enormously important work. And that's what's going to change things. 
That's what's going to destroy the temple and replace it with the kingdom of God. Now, for those of you who have not been paying attention, the, quote, peace process is not working. Okay? It's worse than a lie. It's a snare. It's a delusion. And what it does is allow Israel, with the help, it's not even the help, I mean, we're doing it, of the United States to continue the project of the ethnic cleansing and the colonization of historic Palestine. That's what's happening. It's been happening since the 70s, where the United States' policy, despite what the policy is, uh, is uh, as stated, has been to support Israel in its stated policy, which has always been no Palestinian state. We take it all. And we do what we can with the inconvenient reality of non-Jews who continue to annoy us by continuing to live here and claim that this is their home. That's been the Zionist project and the project of the sovereign state of Israel. There's never been a real prospect of a two-state solution because the ideology that has been determining the policy of the state of Israel has been to get it all and to take it all. And that's the only thing that a state that calls itself a Jewish state can do. I mean, if we, <clears throat> if our founding fathers, <clears throat> they were all fathers, of course, had said this is going to be a Christian country, we wouldn't have the country we have today. We have a constitution that guarantees that even though the majority may be Christian, it's a country for all of its citizens. Really and truly a country for all of its citizens. Never been true of Israel, even though its Declaration of Independence says that. There's no constitution to back it up. Israel is an ethnic, nationalist state. It was conceived at the end of the 19th century when the zeitgeist was ethnic nationalism, which is a total anachronism today. It's not the trajectory of history, certainly not nationalism, and certainly really not ethnic nationalism. So Israel's doing what it has to do, which means that, and this is how Miko Pella gets himself in trouble, if you're really going to take a look at the reality of the situation now, whether you're an Israeli or, or, or an American, whether you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, you know, what have you, if you're really going to take a look at the facts and think about what's going to get us out of this and what's going to create a real peaceful resolution and a just resolution, Zionism's got to go. Now, as a Jew, I understand where Zionism comes from. Believe me, in my cells, I understand where Zionism comes from. It comes from fear. It comes from desperation. It comes from 2,000 years of getting marginalized and kicked around and slaughtered. I know this. I also know that Zionism is not the solution to anti-Semitism. The opposite is the solution to anti-Semitism. I'll get back to Jesus about that in a minute. So I regard Zionism as an understandable, forgivable, and catastrophic mistake. And if you want to know how to relate to the Jewish community, the institutional Jewish community, your Jewish friends, family members, business associates, fellow clergy, who are saying to you, we thought you were our friends, don't you understand this is our thing, we need this, Back off. Don't boycott us. You know, let your hearts bleed for the Palestinians, but don't do anything to change their situation. Back off. If you want to know how to relate to those Jewish people and Jewish institutions who say to, who say to you, we thought you were our friends. You are our friends, right? You do feel bad about what you did to us for 2,000 years, right? Back off. You want to know how to relate to them, I will tell you. 
have compassion for us. But our problem is not your problem. Our problem is that we are in a hole. We are still digging ourselves deeper into it. We are defending something that is indefensible, that would be the end of us as a faith community or as a civilization. And I I don't think that's going to happen, but that's the risk because it's suicidal and it's killing our souls. It's killing the souls of those Israelis, second, third generation now, who thought they were being part of an idealistic, you know, uh, project to build a great new civilization. They didn't know they were being inducted into a racist colonial settler movement. They didn't know that. They deserve better. So have compassion for us, but don't jump in the hole with us. Do what you need to do up here on dry land under the sun and change it and fix it so that there's, some, there's somebody at some point who can extend a hand and help us out of the hole. Do not jump into the hole with us. Do what you need to do. The problem and and the agony and the tragedy of this situation for, and I'll say it again, for faithful Christians and and, and Americans who believe in in, in real American principles of equality and democracy about the situation that we have today is that over here you have an industry of interfaith dialogue and interfaith reconciliation and the building of trust between the church, the Christian community, and the Jewish people that started 69 years ago when the, the, the Western Christian world stood before the ovens and said, what have we done? And that's when it began. We've got to fix this. We have to do something about what, what we've created here with our church that has betrayed its most fundamental principles. And that's a good thing. Anti-Semitism is real, deeply embedded in, in, in Western civilization. It will always be a dark stain on the church. And we have to be vigilant about it like any kind of racism which is what it is. And that work has to go on. That's over here. Over here is a human rights issue. Over here is 65 years of a population and a people who were kicked out and dispossessed from their land and their cities and their farms and who still sit in exile, many, many, in refugee camps, stateless, without even the acknowledgement that they have the right to come home. And a rogue state that is spinning out of control and is about to bring the whole world down around around it. Out of control, self-destructive evil. That's Israel today. You think it's easy for me to say that as a Jew? But if I don't say that, you know, one of the, one of the, I think the psychological center of my first book, and it's in the second book as well, is what happened to me when I went to Yad Vashem, when I went to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. How many of you have been there in your visits to the Holy Land? Okay, it's a stop. Everybody goes there. It's an important place. Okay? And I'd been there many times, but I'd never been there after five days in the West Bank. In 2006, I go there after five days in the West Bank, and my experience of it was completely different, and it turned me around, and it was was huge. Because what I realized was that Yad Vashem, the memorial to six million of my people who had been slaughtered, who had been murdered, was functioning as a tool, a very effective tool of political indoctrination, and nationalism. And that the lesson of Yad Vashem was when you go out on the final, on the final balcony at the, after the final exhibit and 
We look at it on the hills of Jerusalem. Right? We get this because that happened to us. And when you go to Yad Vashem and when you go through two-thirds of the museum, before it gets to the actual extermination camps, it's just like what you just saw on the West Bank. Now, that is, quote, the obscene comparison, right? You can't say that. You can't say that we are doing to others what was done to us. You can't say Jews are acting like Nazis. Well, it's clear to me that what is obscene is not to be able to say that, not to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what? We know better than anybody else. We're capable of the same evil as anybody else. My most profound experience in Germany was talking to Germans, German Christians, who came to listen to me, and who needed desperately to be relieved of the, what's a mirror image of my, what's my problem? What's my neurosis as a Jew? I'm the worst victim that the world has ever seen. The Holocaust is a capital H. We own it. We own genocide. It happened to us. It's the worst thing that ever happened to anybody. We own it. We're the worst victims. Treat us that way. Let us do whatever we want. We're the worst victims. And what I said to the Germans was, I'll let go of that if you agree to let go of being seen as the worst criminals who ever walked the earth. Let's all move on. It's liberation for me. It's liberation for them. So back to Jesus. Jesus was bringing Torah. Jesus was saying to his people, if you want to remain true to God and to your tradition, you will resist this tyranny and you will resist it nonviolently because Jesus saw what happened to the violent Jewish rebellions. I mean, he grew up in the Galilee. He saw what the Romans did to Sephorus down the street from Nazareth when there was a Jewish rebellion. They leveled it and there were crucifixions for miles down the road. He said, that's not the way. Here's how you resist tyranny. You follow Torah. You stay with God, the widow, the orphan, the poor. The Ten Commandments, three of them in particular. I mean, never remember which three it is that he repeats in, in, in the New Testament. But that's what Jesus did. He took the Torah and he said, never mind the violent parts. You have to hold on to what's really important and you have to get rid of what's not and what we need to grow out of. And what did we need to grow out of, Jesus said? The temple. The idea that God lives in a house or on a particular mountain and that he gave that to us and that he wants us to have a king who rules over that mountain. The part of the Bible that says, I promise you this piece of real estate. Here's the deed. God's, God doesn't give out real estate. God settled Abraham and his people in the na biblical narrative. That was the first step. And we move on from there. That's what civilization is. We evolve. So Jesus, in my mind, you know, was the greatest Jewish prophet. Took the prophets one more step further. And took it out of territoriality and into universality. That's Pentecost, isn't it? Well, I mean... Before you even get to Pentecost, think about what he said to the woman at the well. Remember, she said, why are you talking to me? I'm the other. I'm a Samaritan, right? You pray on this mountain. We pray on that mountain. And remember what Jesus says to her? He says, woman, the time will come when no one will worship God on any mountain. How could he be more clear? And then he stands in front of the temple with his disciples and says, it's coming down. No more temple. Okay, and then he's crucified, and he rises, and he appears to his disciples multiple times after Easter for a period of 30 days. And then he says to them, hang out in Jerusalem, and the power will come to you from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so then once again, the disciples, do they get it? Remember what they said to him? They said, ah, Master power from the Holy Spirit. You're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. We're going to get our temple back. We're going to get our king back. You'll be the king. Somebody will be the king. Right? Great. 
We're here. We're ready. You know? We'll be your cabinet. We'll be your generals, whatever. Jesus is quiet on this issue until Pentecost comes. What happens on Pentecost? How does the Holy Spirit visit the disciples? Now, come on, a little response from the class here. Tongues of fire, yeah. And what does the tongues of fire do to them? No, it's more than they understand each other. They're speaking all the languages of the known world, including Arabic, by the way. The Holy Spirit comes and conveys on them to pow the power to communicate to everyone in the entire world, no matter where they live and what language they spoke. I think it was close to, what, 15, 20 languages are enumerated in there. And then he says, okay, now you've got the power from the Holy Spirit. You get the message, leave Jerusalem, go through Judea and Samaria. Do not pass go. Right? Keep going to the ends of the earth. What could be more clear? And so then what did the Western Christian world, Catholic and Protestant, after World War II, in this penitential reconciliation project, took three steps backward from the core of Christianity and said, we were really bad to the Jews. We we're really sorry. We were really wrong. God loves you best. Take the land. Here's the deed. We're all Zionists now. Now, that was a moment of truth for Christianity, for the Christian world. What did you need to do at that point when you stood in front of those ovens and saw what the church had done, what your theology had done? You needed to say, who are we? What allowed this to happen? Because that was the Holocaust. I mean, the Nazi Holocaust, like innumerable genocides perpetrated by one people upon another in the name of God, God mit uns, was about, it's us. God's with us. We're better. That's what caused this. That's what we have to look deep into ourselves and find a way to, 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 to get out of us. Listen to Brian McLaren when he comes. When's he coming? In a couple of weeks? A couple. Listen to Brian McLaren. Don't miss him when he comes here at the end of March. Because I mean, you're saying, well, yeah, but Christianity, is this, didn't, you know, Jesus, didn't Jesus say, I'm the resurrection and life, and no one comes to the Father except by me? I mean, doesn't that mean that we're it? That, that we're the, you know, right? Listen to Brian McLaren on that, because he, he, he makes it exceptionally clear that John chapter 14, verse 6, means exactly the opposite of how it's been interpreted. Jesus was not saying, believe in me and you'll go to heaven become a, quote, Christian, which, of course, Jesus could never have said because there was no such thing. He was saying, look at me, understand who I am, understand what I've been saying to you for three years, and you'll know that the way to the Father is to open the gate and let all the different kinds of human beings through. That's how you go through that gate. It's, if there's one God, there's only one God and that God has to love everyone, and everyone has to be equal under God. So the church got it completely wrong, of course. Somebody made, I had lunch with the, um, with the, uh, with the board today, and uh, I, I, you know, I won't mention his name, although I'm sure he wouldn't mind. He's a, 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 a pastor. And what was the joke? Somebody said, um, there are a lot of, we were talking about the fact that there are, there are people working in this movement who are, who are religious and, and people who are working who are, who are not religious and some people are related, to, connected to churches and, and, and some people are not and, and I think what he said was well, there are a lot of churches that are not religious either that are not connected to religion. <laughs> okay, so it's almost 8 o'clock so let's, 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 let's wrap this up a little bit and then get to, to talking about this. <coughs> um, 
back to politics. Now that we've established that the roadmap to peace is not the peace process and the two-state solution, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Galatians, and Philippians, and Romans. Especially Galatians. And that the church has it within its power. The real church, what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community, or the church within the church, the real church, has the ability to take this movement forward, as it has done in the past, because the process that's going to bring peace to the Palestinians and the Israelis and to the Middle East, ultimately it's going to be a political solution, and the diplomats and the politicians are going to do it. But the process that brings them there is going to bear enormous similarity to the process that brought an end to apartheid in South Africa and to Jim Crow in America. And that was a grassroots movement that pushed the politics and that asserted that systems like apartheid and like Jim Crow could not stand, not in a civilized society. And what was common about those two movements it was the role of the churches, certainly here with the civil rights movement. You know, actually, I've said this to, to, um, to groups of, of, of African Americans, some church and some sort of secular, and some of the secular people have disagreed. They said, no, 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 you can't say that it got started in the churches, and it was the labor movements, and all kinds of other stuff. I will tell you, and I get to say this because I'm from the outside of that community, I am convinced that the movement got its spiritual and moral energy from the Gospels, from the pastors who were the, who were the leaders of that movement. It was a church movement founded on Gospel principles. You read the letter from the Birmingham jail, and Martin Luther King Jr. was saying, the way to do this is all written down from emulating the early Christians who believed they were a congregation of God, of heaven, called to obey God and not man, which is why we have to have the boycotts and the sit-ins. We have to be troublemakers, just like the early Christians who were dismissed as outside agitators everywhere they went. They dusted off their shoes, and they went on. And that's how they did it, and that's how we're going to do it. And then it spread to the, you know, to, to, to the white churches, and then it spread to the entire um, uh, society of America, but it got started there. And the final nail on the coffin of apartheid was when the churches of South Africa got together in 1985, wrote a, state, wrote a, uh, uh, a document called Kairos, a challenge to the church, not to the South African government, but to the church, and said, we have been collaborating with apartheid. We've been providing it with theological justification. We've been passively going along with it. We are not with Jesus as long as we continue to do that. This is a tyranny. It has to come down. Just like the Palestinians in 2009 wrote, the occupation is evil. As Christians, we are called upon to resist. Brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, join us, be with us as faithful Christians. And so the church is called to do this again. The church can't do it alone, but I don't think we can do it without the churches. And it's already, it's already begun. Now, what's the challenge? You have a couple of challenges. You have the same challenge that was faced by Jesus when he marched into Jerusalem or he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. And where the Pharisees, okay? The establishment. Just like the the people who wrote the letter to Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963, the Le Birmingham letter, read it again if you haven't read it recently. They said to him, hey, slow down. Be quiet. Let us work through channels. We've got something good going on here with this new Mayor Birmingham. Yeah, he's a segregationist, but he's a nicer one. Let us work through channels. Back off from the sit-ins and the boycotts. Okay? And the Pharisees, you know, the clergy, working with the establishment, said to Jesus, can you tell your people to pipe down, please? You're getting us in trouble with Rome. We got to th we, we're working this out. We're working for you. Work with us. Tell them to be quiet. 
Remember what Jesus said? So beautiful. Remember what he said? If these were quiet, the very stones would shout out, you can't stop this. It's coming from the people. They're so full of joy about their own personal liberation and being close to God and calling out for what God really wants. You can't silence this. The stones will cry out. That's why the Palestinians call themselves the living stones of the land. Okay. Moderation. That's the enemy here. Not that moderation is a bad thing, but when it is used to tell the stones to be quiet, when it is used to tell the people who are advocating boycott and sit-ins and non-legal, non-violent, effective resistance, then that's the enemy. The South African church people, when they wrote this 1985 document, you know what they were responding to? South African government already on the ropes. The sanctions were starting. was starting to have an effect. They said, okay, 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 okay. Reform. We'll do reforms. We'll put blacks in our parliament. Of course, it's four black people you know, to one white person in terms of their votes, but yeah. And we'll give you your own country, your own homelands. We'll surround you. We'll put our people in who work for us. They're black, but they work for us. And you'll have your own country. Two-state solution. That's what's on the table now. That's what John Kerry is working for now. A two-state solution. Now, there can be a two-state solution. There can be two states living side by side in peace and security. That's fine. But what's that border look like? Is it a wall? Where do the Palestinians live? Do they live in prisons and self-enclosed enclaves surrounded by Israelis and by us? Or is it really two states living side by side in equality? Is that wall, is that border a wall? Or is it, a, is, it, is it an open border? So don't buy the two state solution. In fact, don't get involved in talking about one state or two states. The question is human rights. What's this solution look like? Is it based on defending the good, white, Judeo-Christian, democratic Israel from the dark, evil, terrorist Muslims? Because, of course, Palestinians are Arabs, and all Arabs are Muslims, and all Muslims are terrorists. Or is it based on some sort of equality? When people say to me, so it sounds like you're not a two-stater, so you must be for a one-state, you know, because that, that means you, but then if there's one state, then there won't be a Jewish state anymore. And I say, you know, we'll work that out. Don't worry about whether there's a Jewish state or not. I'm not having the one-two-state conversation anymore. We have one state. Nico said this to me, didn't he? We have one state. I said it before Nico, by the way. We have one state. It's called Israel. It's an apartheid state. Our job is to say no to that. It's unacceptable. And we won't have our government and our tax dollars building that anymore. That's our job. That temple has to come down. What comes to replace it? Hopefully it's going to be a lot closer to the kingdom of God. What it actually looks like will be whatever political solution it is, which will come hopefully closer to the kingdom of God. But, you know, I mean, isn't that what Friday to Sunday is all about? You know, every day is Sunday. Every day we're reborn. Every day we try to bring ourselves closer to the kingdom of God. Every day, you know, we mysteriously disappear from that tomb and go on. But we, you know, when we get there is when we'll get there. So that's what the Palestinians are calling us to do. And it's much, much bigger than Palestine. So let me, um, let me end <coughs> with, um, as I often do, <coughs> with, the, the, with the gospel again, the, the, the gospel of Martin. In his letter, near the end of the letter, where he's talking about 
the despair and the disgust and the uh, uh, exhaustion that many people regard the church with because the church has run out of steam and the church is not providing them with the inspiration and the guidance that they need. He said, this is an opportunity for the church. This is what the church is really about. He said, if the church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, the true meaning of what it means to be a Christian, to pick up that cross, whatever it is, whether the cross, and in your case, what's the cross? The cross is being called the worst name you can be called, anti-Semite. You're not. Are there anti-Semites out there? Are there people who love to see people criticizing Israel? Of course there are. It's not you, and it's not this movement, and it's not BDS. What got divestment of sanctions is an act of love for the Jewish people. If anybody says, you can't boycott Israel because you're boycotting the Jews, first of all, what you say to them is, the Jewish people is not the state of Israel. The state of Israel is a sovereign state that calls itself the Jewish state. It's not the people of Israel. It's not the Jewish people. And Zionism is not Judaism. So you dispense with that. And then you say, first of all, the Palestinian people have called for boycotts. We didn't make this up. And secondly, there are voices within Israel who are calling for boycott, who are saying, save my country. Please do it. Okay? So that's the sacrifice. Go back to, back to Dr. King. If the church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions, and it will be dismissed as an irrelevant social as, as a social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Okay? He said that 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. Those words ring out as if they could have been written yesterday. And we have to listen to them. And it's coming through the Palestinians and those Israelis who are calling for our help today. And it's not for them. They will get what they need. It's for us. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to be truly members of Jesus' synagogue? to be the MC. You no questions? Thanks. Does anybody have any questions? You can make a speech too if you like. I mean, it's a small group. Yeah. You can stand up. All right. Actually, just have an announcement. Yes, something was missed earlier. Uh, people who seek justice in Palestine, we're kind of having a back and forth dialogue with the, with the Jewish Federation. Hope that's not a shock to anybody here. Uh, the next installment of that will be Professor Alan Dowdy uh, from Notre Dame. Uh, very interesting uh, WikiLeaks profile. Uh, I believe he might be a Zionist. Uh, this will take place at 7 o'clock at the History Center on uh, February 12th. Uh, we have to be activists. We have to quit talking about activism and be activists. I've been an activist since 2002. We protested the Iraq War every month, every month, mm -hmm. until the start of 2012. And we really did. The, the, one of the strangest things is there was a day the last time Israel went at Gaza where six or seven Palestinians came and joined our rally these are people that never came out for Afghanistan, mm. never came out for Iraq. <clears throat> they came out for Palestine. That is so, it, it is an example of, of how strongly the Arab world feels about this issue. And there are quite a few Arabs. And, and it is, it's something that we need to do uh, to actually save uh, Jewish people because they're heading over a cliff. This is an untenable situation. So anyhow, this is just something, I mean, to be polite and, and to, to listen to what he's saying, and, and there'll probably be a question and answer 
Everybody has light refreshments. It's all very nice. But uh, people are being killed. I, I had an Iraqi, and he showed me a video of IDF forces shooting two small children. They were probably nine and ten overhand rock throwers, not slingers. I mean, you can kill somebody with a slung stone. And I kind of feel like I was a chicken because I wouldn't put it on cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's time to do that. Maybe it's time to show what's really happening. And anybody who has questions about the history of ethnic cleansing and the Jewish people, Deuteronomy chapter 7 pretty much explains it. And uh, That's it. Okay. That's it. No Thank question. You. Speech. Thank you. Anybody Keep have a up. question? Uh, Fort Wayne is a long way from the Middle East, and um, why isn't it? Why does our government keep supporting Israel in the way it supports it? And why don't we know? I mean, I look around and I see the same people I go to church with here for the most part, and um, and I feel insulated from the, the real kinds of things, unless I go to Tel Aviv or, or Palestine and visit myself and look for myself, it's hard to uh, get the kind of press unless it's countercultural kinds of newspapers. Um, why doesn't it on any of our topics that uh, we all talk about uh, Bieber? And uh, so why can't we add these kinds of scandalous or horrifying horrific things that's happening in Palestine and it's not in our, in our news. Why is that kept from us? I mean, it's a good question and it's, and, and it's, 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 it's a long answer. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I think the, the short answer is that I think that um, Israel and what it represents uh, is, fits very, very well into the dominant American narrative that we're supposed to buy and that we're fed all the time. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you think about America's early history, it's a history of ethnic cleansing. It's a history of people who felt that God was on their side and that you know, our destiny was to take over this entire continent uh, because we were the people of God and we had to get rid, get rid of the savages. So, I mean, I think it's in our DNA and we have to acknowledge that. Uh, the war on terror, you know, is another, is another iteration of that. For me, the beauty of this uh, movement is the opportunity for Americans to see this enemy, this dark enemy that hates our freedom, uh, and see the so-called friend, Israel, and to have their heads turned around. And the opportunity is the tens of thousands of Christians who visit the Holy Land every year in devotional pilgrimages to, quote, walk where Jesus walked. Because if you see what there is to really be seen, and not everybody does, you'll not only walk where he walked, you'll see what he saw. You know, you'll see tyranny, you'll see ethnic cleansing, you'll see soldiers doing what they do to innocent victims. Um, which is why I think that one of the most important uh, action steps that the Palestinian document and the American Kairos document, which you can see, and I encourage you to go to kairosusa.org. Kairosusa.org is a gateway to the South African Kairos, to the Palestinian Kairos, to the American Kairos, and to lots of other Kairos documents that are coming out all over the world now in solidarity with the Palestinians that are saying, if we as Kore South Koreans, Americans, Brazilians, Germans, British are going to be, are really going to deal with our own contextual issues having to do with what we're doing to our own indigenous populations, how we're dealing with our poor people, etc. We will connect with the Palestinians because that'll put us back on our feet to do what we need to do here as well as being in solidarity with them. So it's an enormously important opportunity, I think. I think the easy answer to what you're saying is get it into the churches. Have the people in the churches connect with people in the community who are, don't step into churches and they don't need to. 
and work with them on this issue. And then visit your elected representatives and tell them that you're not happy about our policies. And get out there and boycott Israeli products. Not because it's going to bring Israel to its knees, but because it's going to create an awful lot of interest and buzz, just like the Super Bowl commercial with Scarlett Johansson. It was, it was a beautiful thing. How many people are now saying, well, what's, what's up with this? What's this Soda Stream thing? Why are, they, why are they angry at poor little Scarlett? And enough people will start to ask questions about that. So that's how it begins, and that's how it spreads. And it's little. It starts little. When I spoke to the South Africans, I said, how'd you guys do it? They said, uh, we were never unified. Sometimes it just felt like it was a half a dozen of us. But we persevered, and we finally were successful because it, that's what needed to happen. And that's how the civil rights movement started as, uh, as well. You can talk to African Americans these days, and it's 50 years since the March on Washington, right? And they say, oh, yeah, now everybody marched with Martin. They said, not so. It was a small cadre. Most African-American church leaders were not with them. They said, let's go along to get along. Let's not rock the boat. We're doing okay. We'll get there, but let's not rock the boat. And guess who prevailed? So don't think you're little, because you're little, but you're mighty. Keep it up. Uh, Mark, I've got a, maybe a, a couple of questions. Uh, one, we've in recent days, we've seen uh, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and his uh, difficult conversations really still advocating for this two-state mm -hmm. solution. And uh, I'm hearing you say that it might not be all that helpful to try to be supportive of him. Uh, uh, and could you, can you, uh, uh, what we talked about earlier this afternoon about the letter of the 15 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what w use we might make of that in our, in our congregations yeah. or faith communities? Uh, I wish we had thought of, well, just, just go to the Kairos USA website and you can find the letter of the 15. I, it would have been nice if we had thought of maybe putting it out in the stack and maybe table it. You need to go and find it. And in October, maybe it was November of 2012, uh, 15 church leaders um, from major Protestant denominations and several um, uh, peace churches as well as a couple of Catholic orders um, published an open letter to members of Congress saying, uh, we deplore violence on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They made that, you know, they, they put that language in, but they said, they, we really feel that the reason that there is a problem is Israel's policies of annexation and settlement building. <coughs> And uh, we hold our, our own government responsible for financially and diplomatically supporting that. Um, we think that we are in violation of our own laws that prohibit us from giving uh, aid to countries, especially military aid that's being used for purposes that violate uh, internationally agreed um, law about human rights. And we think, and we would like to... Uh, we, we're asking for an investigation of our aid to Israel. Huge thing that they wrote. It's right there for you to use. You take that to your elected representatives. You say, "Your denomination, unless you're Episcopalian, which in case you can't, in, in which case you can't say that, but if you're Methodist, uh, Congregationalist, you know, UCC, Lutheran, um, Presbyterian, Brethren." Um, you can take this to your elected representatives and say, we agree with this. What are you doing about it? Um, John Curry would like to do the right thing. Okay? And, he ha and he's a politician, which means that he will do what is possible. Right? Politics is what's possible. Right now, it's not possible to require of Israel, politically, to require of Israel that it agree to something where they don't occupy the Jordan Valley, keep all the settlements in place that they've got, move the border to encompass all of the settlements, and basically control all of Palestine, in which case that's a two-state solution that's not okay. That's all John Kerry can do right now. 
we need to help John Kerry or whoever is his, his successor in the next administration be able to go to Israel and say, that's enough. Here's what you're going to do. And if you don't, um, there are consequences. No more money, diplomatic isolation. You know, this game is over. Now, John Kerry can't do that now. He can't do that without us. Just like, you know, Ronald Reagan was not, was not going to um, uh, allow the sanctions to go ahead back in the 80s. Until the pressure from the denominations and from the, the grassroots in this country uh, made its impression on Congress. And Congress overrode his veto. Congress made Reagan agree to sanction South Africa. He didn't want to do it. Bad for business. Now, Congress didn't decide that they were going to do the right thing because it was the right thing. They decided to do what they felt was politically possible for them because that's what their constituencies were demanding. That's what we've got to do here. It's the only way. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how that's going to roll out. But that's what has to happen. And I think it happens here. I'm sorry. Answering your question. It happens here. If we go back, excuse me, if we go back a few years, what did Itzhak Rabin want to happen when he was assassinated? Yeah. Yitzhak Rabin, the, no, the, the Nobel laureate. Yeah. Um, I can't look into his eyes or in his soul, but I will tell you what Yitzhak Rabin did as prime minister. Okay, he built as many settlements as Ariel Sharon. And when the Intifada broke out, he said, break their bones. This is the man of peace. Okay, Yitzhak Rabin was the prime minister of Israel. It doesn't matter that he was the Labour Party rather than the Likud Party. Okay. Yitzhak Rabin was the Prime Minister of Israel. What he had to do was basically build an Israel that was there to defend itself against the threat from the Palestinians, as if that were possible, as if the Palestinians could present a threat to Israel. So um, I think that for us to look for either the Palestinian Gandhi or the Israeli, you know, de Klerk, at this point is not the direction to go in. I don't think we're going to see leadership. We're not going to see leadership from the Palestinians because they have no leadership. They, what they have is Herod. What they have is Vichy. The Palestinian Authority was created by us in Israel, and they work for us. And, the, and Israel is basically ungovernable in terms of any kind of political will. The left is gone. And Israel will continue to elect with people like uh, Bibi Netanyahu. You know, when he was elected, and people said, oh, he lost, you know, Tzipi Livni, we wanted Tzipi Livni, you know, she'd be more moderate, she would make peace with the Palestinians. That's something that I don't want to say in church, is what that is. When, when, when Bibi was elected, I said, yes, good, bring it on, let's see the real thing, not a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, the solution is not going to be in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv or in Ramallah. The solution is going to be in Washington, Berlin, London, Paris. We have to stop it because this is our creation. Israel's not going to be able to pull itself out. And that's what Israelis are telling you. That's what Miko will tell you. Uh, idealizing Yitzhak Rabin. People, I mean, that's the fantasy people want to hold on to. Oh, if we're being, we're not assassinated, there would be peace. Bullshit. That's Israel. Israel has to change radically. It's like saying, you know, do you think the clerk woke up one day and said, well, your apartheid is bad. I just I can't. He couldn't govern anymore. That's what has to happen to Israel. Bibi can't govern anymore. That's when things will change. And that's up to us. It's not going to happen internally. I feel very discouraged when I look at 
the number of Christian Zionists in this country. And when you say this needs to be a grassroots movement, how do, how do we reach that, that ultra-conservative group of people who are massively supporting Israel with uh, more than the Jewish community? Forget about it. You're not going to reach them. Focus on the people who you can reach, which is a lot more than them. And I'm talking about evangelicals as well as mainline Christians. <clears throat> There's a very, very broad middle that is not committed to an eschatology that says, you know, the Jews have to be, in, have to have all of Jerusalem before the second coming can happen. Most Christians don't believe that. I mean, there are a lot that do, that want to believe that. And I don't talk to them because I'm not going to reach them. I'm not going to reach them. Any more than I'm going to reach the Jews who believe that God wants us to have this and too bad for the Palestinians. We've got to get rid of them. But I can reach Christians, um, again, across the board, white, black, evangelical, mainline, who are, who, who, who are hungry for a message that, that, that tells them what they already know deep inside, which is that there's something wrong with the theology that justifies what's going on. And they will find a way to, make, to, 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 to think about that. Theology is not static. Theology is something that has to be in conversation with history. You do theology in response to the challenges that are presented to you in every generation. It's not static. What is God? And theology is not God. It's not understanding God. It's trying to understand what we already know God wants from us. We all know that in our hearts. People that don't have that in their hearts, who are not looking for that, I don't need to try to reach them. It's not, you know, there's too many other people to reach. So don't be discouraged by the Christian Zionists. Forget about the Christian Zionists. Now, there's two kinds of Christian Zionism. There's John Hagee and the dispensationalist nutcases, right, who believe in that kind of end time stuff, which is heretical and not biblical. It has nothing to do with the Bible. And then there are the Christian Zionists who are hiding in plain sight in the mainstream, who say, well, yeah, I mean, doesn't it say in Genesis that God gave us the land? You know, but they're asking that question. You can get to them. They can understand that. There's a lot of work to do. Thank you for coming. Um, I believe on the 12th we'll have <coughs> another conversation, probably separate. The question that I have, and, and, and I keep thinking, the two Western nations building walls right now are Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's like I keep trying to remember why Reagan wanted walls pulled down. But my, my big question, and you know, John and his congregation here has been instrumental in many cases at bringing conversations. I remember the Corpus Christi discussion at IPFW that John was very much a part of helping. How can Fort Wayne meld these two discussions so that we all might learn something for the future? And perhaps ask John to help get it started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would someone like to uh, take that question? Because I'm not so sure what the other discussion is, so I can't really address it. Yeah. Separate conversations are happening together. But that's the, is that your question? Yeah, okay. We've answered it from our end, but I think that that answer has been unsatisfactory <laughs> to some of the folks here. And so they're wanting you to kind of yeah. uh, step in and give, give, a, uh, give a response. Um, I'm all for conversation as long as it's a conversation. And I have learned 
when to step away from an invitation to a conversation when it's not an invitation to a real conversation. Um, you have to make your own decisions about that. Um, but how, how, can, how, can I, how can I phrase this? Um, it's, getting ug it's ugly out there, and it's going to get uglier. Um, as this movement grows, the opposition, which is massively funded, well-organized, and getting smarter, is also going to grow. Because they don't want you to do this. And there are m the big interests involved here, and it has nothing to do, by the way, with protecting Israelis from, quote, Arab aggression. It has to do with money and power. And that's what you're up against, and it's big. doesn't mean you're not going to win. You'll win. But it, it, it's big. So you have a very well organized and fairly well thought out public relations strategy that's now being visited upon you. And it's being visited upon you here in Fort Wayne, as it is at many other places in this country, by something called the Israel Action Network, which is working through the local Jewish federations and providing them with strategy and with scripts and with all kinds of resources. And their job is to shut you down. That's what they want to do. They don't want to talk to you. They want to shut you down in whatever they, way they can, and they're starting off with a velvet glove. Let's talk. Right? We're on the same side as you. We don't like what Israel's doing in the settlements either. We want to stop that. Let's talk about it. But they want to stop BDS, and they want to neutralize you. And they're and, and, and they, they are seeing that they're losing. You know, the Presbyterians are going to pass that divestment thing this year. And the Methodists are not far behind, and the UCC is on board now. And those are going to be, those are going to be huge. That's going to be a shot heard around the world when the Presbyterians pass that. And so far, the opposition has been able to stop that from happening. But they can't stop it, and it will happen. And that's a wonderful thing. So I would encourage you to, um, to be skeptical, to be cautious, to be suspicious, and to be self-respecting about invitations for dialogue, which are not invitations for dialogue, but which are part of a calculated strategy to shut you down and to neutralize you. Be aware that that's what it's about. And, be, and, and evaluate every invitation. Now, I'm not saying that every invitation is part of that, but that's the burden that you, uh, uh, that's the burden you have to satisfy before you say yes. Because the, the best thing that can happen there is that it's going to waste your time. And you don't have time to waste. Now, it's not fun for Michael to say to the Jewish Federation, we're not going to accept your invitation. We're not going to talk to you. You're not going to talk to us? We want to have a dialogue, Jewish-Christian dialogue. We've been doing it for generations. And that was a good thing. Well, I, I mean, I have mixed feelings about it for lots of reasons, but it's basically a good thing. In the current context, it's not a good thing. In the current context, it's counter-movement. In the current context, let me tell you a story because for me, I've, it's, it's, it's never left me. And it's in a very different context, but it's the same context. It's the same situation. We were, it was 2006, and we were in Ramallah at Berzeit University. Berzeit University is a Palestinian university. By the way, the Palestinians have more universities per capita than any people on the face of the earth. So this is Berzeit. It's a fine university, very political. If you're a student at Bears State University, you wear a, uh, uh, a kind of a stole or a, a scarf with a particular color. That's the political party that you're allied with. Everything is political there. It's not necessarily a good thing, but that's the situation that they're in. So we're sitting in the student uh, center with four kids, four college students from Bears State. Beautiful young people. I remember this one guy in particular, his name's Ahmed. He's movie star gorgeous. And uh, they're talking about their political work and what they're doing to organize uh, Palestinians and educate them about resistance, and, and et cetera. 
And we had just come from Jerusalem, and we had had some conversations with some uh, Jewish Israeli students from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And I said to him, sort of, I think I was kind of fishing. I said, so do you ever have these conversations with your counterparts, with your Jewish counterparts at, at HU? And, uh, you know, about resistance and about, because they're also, you know, not happy with the situation. And he looked right at me and he said, no. Mm -mm. We don't. And we won't. Not until that Jewish kid is ready to take off his Israeli army uniform and not be my jailer at the checkpoint. He's saying no to dialogue, to Jews and Palestinians talking together about peace. There are people now who are saying no to getting Israeli, Jewish, and, and Palestinian kids together in Cyprus or in camps in Maine to get to know each other and to realize that they don't have to be enemies. And they do, and they get to know each other, and they realize that they don't have to be enemies, and they understand each other's narratives, and it's all wonderful. And I believe it's the wrong thing to do now, because it lulls people into thinking that this is peacemaking. Because those Palestinian kids go back to the West Bank, they can't even fly home through the same airport as the Israelis do, And it would be like saying, in, in, in apartheid South Africa, let's get the Afrikaners, you know, and the Africans and the black Africans together to understand each other's narratives. You know, let's have the Africans, the black Africans understand how bad the Afrikaners feel about having had the crap beaten out of them by the British in the Boer War. And then let's have the Afrikaners understand, you know, how hard it is to live in the townships and have to carry identification cards and live under curfew. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Before we get rid of apartheid? Does that make sense? That's what's happening now. They want to have dialogue. They want to have, they want you to understand how Jews feel and why we feel we have to have Israel. That's not making peace. Making peace is shutting it down. Making peace is making Israel ungovernable because that's the only way that the Israelis will be liberated from the apartheid that they live under as well. So we have to be strong about that. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. We're getting yanked around. That's the current context. Then we can have reconciliation once the politics have changed. That's what we're up against. You visit a lot of communities and see other groups and how they're addressing the issues. And I wondered if, if you'd have some observations of uh, how what you've seen that's effective that we might apply. Um, we've had, and in defense of John and this congregation, we had the bright stars of, of Bethlehem here mm -hmm. as, as a, a performing group. And uh, Mike and I got to go to... Uh, uh, um, Georgetown University at, at Peter Yarrow's invitation and saw uh, a Gothic uh, hall and assembly that was four times the mm -hmm. size of this, uh, full of young people and, and uh, professors uh, for music. And I, and I remember John Clegg and uh, One Man, One Vote and, and how the arts uh, helped implement uh, that change. Uh, just throwing out that as a... Mm -hmm. What have you seen effective uh, in some of the other communities? Um, I would like to encourage you to reach out to other churches and other communities here in Fort Wayne and to try to increase your own numbers and increase your connectivity. I would, uh, I'd like to see you reach out to the African American community through their churches or maybe through their, uh, their community organizations that are working for, for uh, civil rights. Um, I would uh, like to see you uh, 
um, get to students at local campuses and in high schools, for example. I've given lots of I've given lots of talks in Catholic high schools. It's awesome. The kids are hungry to hear about this kind of stuff. Um, or Catholic colleges, or uh, even you know evangelical schools that you have around town, or state schools. Um, so I, I think expand what you're doing and reach out and, and train people and tell them about what they, you know, what, what you have learned and, and, and what you feel they need to hear. Um, so increase awareness and increase education. I think that the big, um, kind of the big events are neat and they're, they're cool, but you've got to get people to them. So you need to do your, I think you need to do your homework in, 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 in at the grassroots I'd like to take this just a little different direction. As we look at the demolition and the things that are happening on the West Bank, um, what can our response be to Caterpillar, to Hewlett Packard with our um, funds, our investments, encouraging our church organizations which have funds mm -hmm. uh, invested in um, some of those companies. Is that of much value in this whole process or is it just a way to say to the Palestinians, we support you? Um, I, I think it's of enormous, I think it's a big, uh, an, an important thing that's happening with the denominations, but you can, uh, what church do you belong to? Do you belong to this church? Mennonite, okay. Um, I don't know what the Mennonites are doing on a, I mean, I know the MCC is doing important work over there. Um, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm still trying, learning about how the Mennonite church is, is, is organized. Is it fairly centralized? You have like, um, and you have investments, right? And is there anything going on in the Mennonite church about the investments, like with the Presbyterians or the Methodists? Yeah, I mean, I would really support that. I mean, I think that makes a difference. Mennonites signed that document, by the way, about the ab about the, the, the sanctions. So that's the S part of BDS. But I can't imagine that a peace church is going to want to uh, not be part of this movement. So I would work up through your own congregation, through your own regional organization, however it works, right up through the central um, administration of the Mennonite church and do that. I think it's important. I think it, will, I think it has political significance. I think that when enough people can go to the White House and go to the halls of Congress and say, look at what the Mennonite Church has do is doing along with, you know, the big tall steeple denominations and, you know, diocesan Catholic Church, I'm not expecting anything from in a long, for a long time, but, you know, you know, Pax Christi and the other, and, and some of the, and some of the uh, monastic orders, um, that, that will make a difference. Um, in terms of, of, of political advocacy. So I think it's an, important, it's an important part of the picture. If that doesn't happen, any activism that you have here has no credibility. Now, having said that, I've also seen, and I've worked a lot with Presbyterians in particular, and, and Methodists as well, I have seen them exhaust themselves trying to push things up through their denominational bureau bureaucracies. And, you know, uh, you're a Mennonite, so I don't think that it, it, you, have, you have had experience of what it's like to work within one of those denominational bureaucracies. It's heartbreakingly frustrating because it's very bureaucratic, it's very methodical, and, and, and I suppose that's a good thing, and they're getting there, and it's important work, but you can't put all your eggs in that basket. You've got to work at the grassroots as, as well. So I, I think it, you've got to do all of it and choose what particular strategy works best for you. Let's say thank you to Mark and Lynn.
if you could just sit down just for a moment for some closing announcements. I think Mark would be the first one who would want to say thank you to all of you for coming out on such a night like this uh, to listen to his talk. I know that uh, we appreciate it, and I know that Mark appreciates it too. Uh, he came in from Portland, Oregon. He leaves tomorrow morning to go back to Portland. He, he was trying to block out this week when we were first con conversations about this, and yet he uh, made this special trip for us here, and we really are appreciative, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, the Presbyterians have been leading the way on this, uh, uh, on BDS. I'm, I'm also a part of the National Committee for the United Church of Christ, the Palestine-Israel Network. They're meeting in Washington, D.C. yesterday and today and leaving tomorrow. But I'm here because, Mark, you're here. That's why I'm not at those meetings. Um, Methodists, like you say, and other denominations. So those do not, it, it's gaining momentum. BDS movement's gaining momentum. I just want to remind you, uh, uh, half the sky on February 17th, 18th, we're postponing. Greg Meyer, Thursday, February 27th. Brian McLaren, uh, Mark mentioned, one of the leading theologians today in the Emerging Church Movement, uh, Thursday, March the 20th. And especially, I, wanna, I guess I want to point this one out uh, uh, as we go uh, forth tonight. Sunday, April the 6th. Uh, Sunday, the April the 6th, it's going to be up at IPFW. We're really pleased to be uh, hosting Carrie Newcomer, who's a, a recording artist, uh, sings spiritual music. She's offered, she, tra she and her husband traveled with me to Israel and uh, Palestine uh, uh, this past year, and she's offered to do a benefit concert on behalf of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. That's in the evening, uh, Sunday, April the 6th at IPFW. Uh, you can check out all this information on our website, and so please uh, consult the website for dates and times, but also I want to really make a pitch for you to come to the benefit concert Sunday, April the 6th. Put that on your calendars. It's at 6, 6.30? 6 o'clock it begins. Thanks, honey, 6. So anyway, um, anything else I need to say? We're able to, we're able to uh, bring people like Mark Braverman and these other folks in here because of your generous financial support. So we're always, uh, you know, I'm so bad at this, but I'm learning how to do it. Um, we really uh, appreciate any kind of financial support you can offer us, either tonight or throughout the year. We really are appreciative of all that you do. Finally, finally uh, be peacemakers in your own lives, and God speed you on your way home tonight, uh, uh, on your way home. Uh, be safe, and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>